Uh, I'll add just one more point to uh, uh, the introduction, and that is I was invited about three years to go to Columbia and to give grand rounds there. And uh, uh, they had very generously invited me to her, her personal home. And I've never been in a home where there were no walls that had anything but books. It was absolutely <laughs> incredible. And in fact, when I tried to go to the bathroom, you had to move books to see where it was. <laughs> but anyway, what is really remarkable is she's read all those books, and she remembers a lot of them. And what is unique about the first cell is this beautiful blend of uh, culture and uh, uh, literary uh, uh, breadth intertwined beautifully with the uh, story that we're going to talk about today. So do you want to start by reading a section from your book? Yeah. Thank you, Lee. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming to the town hall for organizing this event. I'm not only very excited to be here because uh, some friends are here, Valerie Khan is here, uh, Lee Hood is, is someone who I greatly admire, respect, adore. I'm so happy that you are my interlocutor. Thank you so much. This is a true, truly an honor for me. Thank you, Lee. I will begin by just reading the prologue from the book and then we can get into a question and answer. In the early spring of 1998, my husband Harvey Preisler was diagnosed with cancer. The following year, we planned to take our five-year-old daughter, Shahrzad, and my brother Javed's two children visiting from Pakistan, Musa and Batul, 8 and 12, to San Francisco for a highly anticipated vacation. We had already postponed the trip twice before, but it could be delayed no longer. The children were eager and given Harvey's disfiguring facial edema and the enlarging node, some form of aggressive treatment sure to require us to stay put in the city for months was now imminent. Before any of that happened, he felt strongly that the family needed to get out of the sweltering heat of Chicago for a vacation, even if it's just for a week. Our flight to San Francisco was on a bright, clear summer morning Having arrived at the gate a good 90 minutes before our departure, we split up. Harvey sat down in the boarding area while I chased the children around O'Hare. We got something to eat at the food court and then returned to the gate. I was shocked by what I saw. Harvey sat looking dazed as streams of sweat poured from his body making little puddles under his elbows on the armrests of the chair and under his knees on the floor. He was beet red. Tributaries of glistening perspiration filled the lines in his handsome face, making it appear startlingly young. He looked at me with a hushed anxiety. I sent Batul running for the nearest cafe to get me a handful of napkins. I dabbed Harvey's face and arms, wiping the chair and the floor. There was no respite. The sweat came in torrential waves. His t-shirt and shorts were entirely soaked and dripping. The children stood around trying not to look, their faces ashen. It was a good 15 minutes before the deluge subsided. I walked to the corner sh gift shop and purchased a fresh pair of pants and shirt. Without saying a word, little eight-year-old Musa stepped forward, quietly took the package from me and gently escorted a bewildered Harvey to the restroom. Being oncologists, both Harvey and I understood precisely what that sweating meant. Known as a B symptom, it's a well-recognized manifestation of many cancers, especially lymphomas. It is not a good sign. B symptoms are associated with a more advanced, more aggressive disease with a poorer prognosis. I suggested we cancel the trip and return home, but Harvey, not willing to disappoint the children yet again, 
insisted on going ahead. The first 24 hours in trans San Francisco were filled with apprehension. As we drove the children around the crooked street and the harbor, not knowing what to expect, fearing the worst, nothing happened. Harvey began to relax. Then in the middle of the third night, I woke up with a start. Water dripped steadily on my face. Harvey's arm was arched over my head, running like a faucet. This time, we not only had to change his clothing, we had to call housekeeping to replace the soaking wet sheets. By the time we returned to O'Hare a week later, Harvey had developed another bizarre syndrome associated with many cancers. His left wrist suddenly blew up to twice its normal size. Despite the extra strength Tylenol I gave him, he was writhing in agony as we climbed in the car to go home. It took 24 hours of cold packs and heavy-duty analgesics to control the excruciating pain. The next few days were some of the most tormented. He experienced regular episodes of drenching sweats once or sometimes twice during the night, requiring fresh bed sheets and clothing changes. As swelling subsided in one joint, it popped up elsewhere without warning. Fresh lesions began with a tingling, burning sensation becoming bright red and sizzling hot within hours. Nomadic lymphoma cells meandered autonomously, rudderless. Edema regressed from the face only to reappear in his joints. Lymph nodes in the neck and armpits swelled one day and receded the next, followed by a sudden enlargement of the spleen. Itinerant cells segregated, dispersed, recollected, vanished, regrouped. They wandered the body with a studied carelessness, entering and leaving organs at will, disgruntled, edgy, exploring possible niches in various organs, rejecting some, settling in others. Horrified, helpless, we watched the drama unfold. Harvey from the inside, I from the outside. The lymphoma, marched on its aimless, monomaniacal journey into irresolution with a motiveless malignity. Cancer is what I had been treating for two decades. Yet, until I shared a bed with a cancer patient, I had no idea how unbearably painful a disease it could be. It was the summer of our discontent. Cancer and its discontent. Thank you very much. I think what's interesting about the passage is we probably can explain relatively few of those symptoms that we see now except in very vague and general ways. And it seems somewhat paradoxical because I think it was in 1971 when Nixon began the war on cancer, a war that's uh, uh, on which we've spent literally uh, tens of billions of dollars. And your book talks about this war and where it is today. Do you want to comment on your feelings about how we're approaching cancer today? Lee, cancer is something that is going to happen to most of us. It's going to strike one in two men and one in three women. It's not something that happens to remotely anymore. And one of my main concerns with the whole cancer paradigm today is to bring the patient back into the discussion front and center. I feel like we have become so obsessed with wanting to cure cancer that we have forgotten about the illness. Disease is something that doctors diagnose and treat, but illness is what patients feel. If we are going to study cancer in animal models, can you think about who has sat up nights to document joint pains and, and night sweats in mice? You can't do it. So the point is, we, by bringing the patient front and center, the idea is that 
we need to study humans and human tissue. We need to think about not just the cure but the healing. There is a violation of the body in a way that demands more than just trying to give drugs to get rid of the tumor. There is a lot more going on. And that's why the whole book that I've written is centered around patient stories. And then I ask the questions. Why since 1971, 200 billion dollars later, all going into cancer research, why are we still using the same draconian stone age measures of chemotherapy, radiation therapy and surgery? There may be many people in this room who have cancer right now. There may be people who have been cured of cancer. And practically most every one of them has gone through the same treatments uh, in one form or another. And the best treatment we know is for the earliest cancer possible. So if you diagnose it in stage 1, 90 percent of most cancers would be cured by surgery followed by some additional adjuvant treatment or sometimes not even that. On the other hand, you diagnose it in stage 4 when it has spread up, then 90 percent patients will not be cured. So, I mean, the whole point of this, uh, this bringing the patient back is to really see what we are doing even to patients that we are curing, which is 68 percent of patients diagnosed with cancer today will become cancer survivors. They will be cured. It's a great statistic. And in the last 30 years alone, uh, we have brought down cancer by 20, cancer mortality by 26 percent. But that decrease in death from cancer is not because of any new treatments we found. It's because of anti-smoking campaigns, number one, and number two, screening measures that began to detect cancer earlier. And the questions I'm asking is, why is that happened? And I have an answer. You should give it to us. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to make me give up the thunder right away. Okay, no. The answer is very simple. It's not for lack of money. It's not for lack of intellectual resources. The best minds in the world, with the most, in the most affluent country in the world, have been working day and night to find the solution. Why are we failing? Because cancer is a very complicated problem. It is not treating cancer as one disease is like treating Africa as one country. It's constantly mutating, metamorphosizing, it is transforming. It's a dynamic process. Most cancers arise because of mutations in DNA and these can happen randomly just during copying errors. Um, during copying of DNA, errors are made naturally and these tend to accumulate. And so the point is, Every time a cancer cell divides into two, it can pick up new mutations, which means every time there is the possibility and potential for a new cancer. So it's a constantly moving target. If I take out a tumor from my lung today and study it, by the time I have the results of this available two months later, the cancer has moved on because it's picked up many more mutations. It's become resistant to drugs that it wasn't resistant to before. So we have to take our blinders off, stop insisting that just because a few smart people are going to put their minds together using excessively reductionist strategies to look at molecular pathways, we are going to solve every intricate problem that a cancer cell has because it's just constantly a moving target. So if we accept that, that means we are going to now go 180 degrees around and say, no, it's so complicated that we can't handle every uh, change in the cell. Why not at the same time turn our attention to early detection, but not by the kinds of measures that have been used for the last 50, 60 years, which is mammography, colonoscopy, pap smears and PSA. 
some of these are so gross, so old, because imagine putting a tube into the gut and looking for a lesion, that's colonoscopy. In this day and age of sophisticated technology, where we are boasting about cutting and pasting DNA, we are proud of godlike technologies we have developed, why are we using these paleolithic measures? Why aren't we bringing the latest technology, devices, imaging technology, wearable things, uh, chips, why aren't we doing all of that to early detection of cancer and just stop it right there? The last thing I'll say before I turn the thing to you is even with the screening measures that were so uh, sort of uh, approximate measures, I would say, like mammography and which pick up tumors that are already fundamentally established, uh, colonoscopy, etc. Um, the point is that even those are done once a year or once every other year or so. Time has come to stop doing these periodic tests, but rather to treat the human body as a machine and constantly monitor it with the technology that we have available that should now be brought to bear on developing the best tests which can monitor continuously. And no one is a bigger advocate of this type of uh, approach than Dr. Leroy Hood himself. You should say something about your approach. <laughs> I think we're here to hear from you and not, not from me. But oh, I'm sure everyone will love to hear because that is what you are trying to do is pick the perturbations caused by disease earlier than the disease's appearance. Okay, I'll say. Uh, so if you think about the general problem, what you'd like to do for everyone in this room is follow them over time and identify the earliest transitions when they move from wellness to a disease, be it cancer or other kinds of disease. And in fact, we over the last four or five years have demonstrated this is absolutely possible because you, one of the things about humans that's so incredible is we're unbelievably complex. And if you want to be able to decipher that complexity, it means you have to make literally billions of measurements. And we can do that now. And we've done it in populations as large as 6,000, where we saw 100 people transitioning from wellness to disease. And we demonstrated in a number of those cases beautifully that we see the initial point of transition by looking at analytes in the blood that become biomarkers for that particular disease transition. What is really important is, one, they indicate to us precisely the point where we want to start a therapy because the disease at its earliest transition is the simplest it'll ever be. That's true of any kind of disease. And number two, those biomarkers give us clues about the kind of therapy we can target at that transition point. And the idea, the simple idea, is that you'll then reverse that disease before it ever manifests itself as a disease phenotype. And that, that really is the, the preventive medicine of the 21st century. And I'll just say there, there are two ways we can carry out these things. We can screen the general population, and these assays still cost a little bit too much to be able to do this easily. Or we now have the ability to identify for more than 100 diseases individuals that are high risk, at high risk for any one of those diseases and we can follow the high-risk individuals, that is, those whose transition probability is much, much greater than just the average person. And we're, we're going to be exploring both of these approaches for uh, Alzheimer's and uh, 
we're talking about doing this for uh, acute myeloid leukemia as well, and that would really be uh, an exciting new approach. But let me get back to another question. One of the proudest accomplishments of this thing called precision medicine, a term that was coined in, in uh, 2015 in the State of the Union address by Obama, is the fact that one can take tumors and sequence their DNA and identify variants in that cancer that enable one to go to all the drugs you have in your armamentarium and say, aha, this is a major mutation here, and here's a drug that can actually attack that mutation, or at least attack the protein that mutated gene makes. And this is, uh, has been used hundreds of times, literally now, and I, I think the major limitation with this is 99% of the time uh, you get a remission that lasts six months or eight months or nine months, and then you go back to being worse off than you were before because you've lost a treatment mode. So, so the question that I think is really intriguing for physicians is, should you advise these patients to pay $100,000 or $150,000 a year for these drugs, yeah. which in some cases they work, and in some cases they don't, but almost never do they lead to a cure? Or you advise patients not to use the drugs. And I think the issue that's really tough is None of us can speak how we behave. When it comes down to it, and you have cancer, you really might want to live another six months and be willing to put yourself through hell to get six or nine months. But I'd love to hear what your thoughts on. I think it's a real conundrum for anybody who's, uh, any oncologist these days. How do you, because you know so clearly what these patients are going to go through when it yeah. starts to go bad. Yeah. So actually, the major impetus for literally writing the book, even though I probably had been writing it in my mind for 35 years, downloaded it in a few months, but the final push that made me do it was because my daughter's best friend since they were 15, at 22 years of age, that was two years ago, uh, at 22 he got diagnosed with an uh, extensive brain tumor, glioblastoma. And it was a nine centimeter tumor, Andrew is his name and he is the chapter six. And the thing that made me write this book is this boy felt tingling in his arm, so he goes to the emergency room. Within hours, he was quadriplegic. Neurosurgeons go in and they could only remove 80% of the tumor, maybe. So now, every oncologist knew from that point that this young man's chances of survival are 0 0.00. As soon as this young man opened his eyes, came to, he turned to his mother and he said, Mom, don't worry at all, just call Azra. She's on the cutting edge of cancer. She will find the right treatment for me. And I felt so ashamed of myself to face this 22-year-old boy. And the chapter I have titled is, Was Honesty a Choice? What do you tell a 22-year-old? We couldn't do anything for him. No, we did. We gave him the worst treatments possible for the 16 months that he survived. Radiation, chemo, more surgery, immune therapy, more radiation, more chemo, more immune. So the entire time his whole gut is like a raw wound.
two weeks before he died, now he's 23, it's last year. Two weeks before he died, they brought him the DNR form to sign, do not resuscitate. He sent it back, he said, I'm not signing this. How does a 23-year-old sign a DNR form? They took it back, but that evening, that night, his father came to spend the night with him to relieve mother and sister. And Andrew, as soon as his father was there, called for the form back. Signed it saying, I couldn't do it in front of my mother. She wouldn't be able to take it. Where does this kind of lonely courage come to a 23-year-old who is dying and is protective of his mother? This is what nations should be building monuments for this kind of courage, this kind of nobility of endurance that is shown by the cancer patients. And so when you ask me the question, what would I advise? The question for Andrew was, a, it was such an existential issue. What do you do? Do you let the cancer kill him or the treatment kill him? The death from advanced cancer is even more painful. So we keep trying to do something. And even if we tell somebody who's 22 or 23 or for that matter 42 or 52, their answer will always be even if there is one, a, one in a million chance I'm ready to take it and you can't blame them for that. The real issue is that why are these the only choices we are offering? Why? Why does it, how many Andrews will it take for us to wake up and accept it that cancer is a silent killer and no age is immune from it? It grew to nine centimeters before this poor boy knew. Look at Alex Trebek, pancreatic cancer stage four. I mean, you, we think we know our minds, we don't. We think we know our bodies, we absolutely don't. Things are going on all the time, we have no idea about. So then what is the ultimate answer? We can get into a debate about whether treatment is good or not. I mean, some, for some people currently, uh, precision oncology, which is targeted therapy, you find a mutation, you have a magic bullet, you can combine the two and in some people, uh, I mean, I have a patient who's living 12 years now with stage uh, 3B lung cancer with brain metastasis five years ago, fully functional because one um, sort of strategy of treatment followed by another, followed by another, each has worked for her. So looking at somebody like that, you are convinced that absolutely we must offer. But on the other hand, for every 22 out of 10 patients that do well, 8 out of 10 are only going to suffer the toxicities and have no benefit at all. And 42% cancer patients in this country, 42% of newly diagnosed cancer patients become completely financially ruined by the second year because of what they are paying for. So if 80% people are just uh, experiencing the toxicity and financial ruin and 20% are benefiting but for a, sh for a limited time still, some may do very well for years. I don't want to uh, paint a doom and gloom picture at all. In fact, the book is a very forward-looking, very optimistic book. Yes, I have described a lot of pain in its granularity, but the idea is not to revel in pain. The idea is for us to shake us up, to realize that this can't keep going on. And this should serve as the impetus to move forward in a completely different direction. So what I am imagining is something like this. Since I said no age is immune from cancer, that means from birth to death we should be monitoring people. Second uh, very important thing is how do we do that? We have to make it all scalable. We have to make it doable. 
So, for example, a cancer when it begins, it divides faster than normal cells. So, it needs more nutrition. So, it starts making blood vessels. So, that area becomes hot immediately. Just when cancer is beginning, there's a hot area. You should be able to go to sleep in bed sheets that scan you overnight for a hot area. Let's say there's an area detected in my pancreas one night by these bed sheets that are scanning me. Does it mean I should have an open abdominal surgery and a Whipple's procedure and take everything out? Of course not. Then it should be monitored, followed carefully like you said. And then there should be 20 other complementary tests to show whether this is actually a cancer, whether it's aggressive enough, whether it's life threatening or not, or is it just a slow growing tumor that will take 20 years to kill. And I'm already 85 for example, I don't need anything uh, if it's going to take 20, 30 years to kill me. So though, what I'm saying is the technology has to be developed and it can be developed very quickly. If we turn our attention simply from going constantly trying to kill the last cancer cell all the time to trying to find the first and just prevent it from happening. And so somebody like Andrew shouldn't have been diagnosed with stage 4 and a 9 centimeter tumor. We should have been monitoring him. And this is doable with wearable devices. But what we have to do is find something that uniquely marks the presence of a malignancy. Those are the footprints we are all looking for. And uh, for me, it was uh, fortunate that I'm an immigrant. I came to this country at 23 years of age uh, with the idea of finding a cure for cancer. And uh, within seven years of studying can, uh, acute myeloid leukemia, I realized that in my lifetime, this will not be cured because it is too aggressive and complicated a disease. And so I turned my attention because many of my patients were giving a history that, oh, my blood counts have been low for two years and now suddenly I have leukemia. Doctors were telling me I had a pre-leukemia. So I, in my 20s, got interested in, oh, if you can diagnose leukemia at a pre-leukemic stage, why not follow these patients and try to intercept before it becomes this end-stage monstrosity? So with that in mind, I started simply banking all the tumors, uh, bone marrows and blood samples of my patients and that's where it helped me to be a, an immigrant because if I had gone to school in this country, I'd be making a mouse model. But being a foreigner, I depended on intuition rather than tradition and custom. And my intuition was if I'm going to study this disease, I should save samples. So today I have a tissue repository of 60,000 samples from thousands of patients who have been, these have been longitudinally collected. As the disease has progressed in individual patients through its natural history. So blood and plasma and serum and marrow and biopsies, buccal smears, germline controls, all kinds of samples have been and banked. And the outcomes, which is really important. Yes, and all the clinical data, the outcomes. So why did one patient develop from pre-leukemia to acute leukemia in six months and another is doing well ten years later? Surely there is a biomarker we can pick up. We weren't able to do this until now because the technology was not there. But now we have genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, transcriptomics, panomics technologies. And so if we just put our minds to studying actual human samples and using this technology to study the samples, surely we will find the earliest footprints. And then we need to ask the question, why did some healthy individual even develop pre-leukemia? Was there something unique in their DNA that they were born with? Was there like a mutation in a gene like BRCA for breast and ovarian cancer? Is there something for leukemia like that? Surely there has to be. Like you just said, 100 diseases, you can find patients who are at high risk. The people who should be most interested to find the first cell are people that Lee just mentioned are those individuals who are at high risk of getting cancer. Who are they? Again, I don't want to scare anybody, but people who get one cancer are the highest risk of getting another cancer. 
one in five new cancers appear in cancer survivors. So why am I not studying the tissue repository using all this technology to find the first cell, find the right biomarker, put it on, an M, on a chip and then start monitoring healthy individuals for it? Because the work has to be done now. The tissue is there, the technology is there, the clinical data are all there, but it's very expensive to do it. And my commitment is that until I have one last breath left in me, I will keep fighting for it, to do it, to do this, to study the tissue repository samples and do everything that I can to find the biomarkers that will give us the earliest footprint. And you know how easily it can be done. In this country, there are 20 million cancer survivors now. Even if 1 million people just give $10 a month for, $10 a month is nothing. You buy a happy meal these days for $10 a month. You just give it for one year, 1 million people give it, that's $100 million and you and I can do the proteomics that's so badly needed to find the biomarkers. But that's, that's one of the reasons to get the public to become aware that right now all of pharmaceutical industry, everyone is trying to kill the last cell developing therapies that are exceedingly expensive, that are ruining individuals and the country for very little benefit. Do you know that 95 percent, 95 percent of experimental drugs and agents that are brought to the bedside of a cancer patient fail? So if pharmaceutical industry is willing to put in billions of dollars in a venture which has a 95 percent failure rate. Why do they do it? Because they know that if they can show more than 10 seconds improved survival over two and a half months, they will get their drug approved and then they can make a billion dollars a year for the next 20 years. What I am saying is why not set a new goal? and financially incentivize that goal and then everybody who is investing in this failing venture will invest in that. So instead of going after the last cell, let's all develop the techniques to find the first cell. And there is financial gain in it because right now only 1.7 million cancer patients are diagnosed every year and they are the subject and clients of the pharmaceutical industry. But before long, if we have to monitor healthy people, that's few hundred million people from birth to death. So I do think that it has to be done, it will be done. This is the only way we will be able to actually overcome these chronic diseases. We are not going to be able to cure them for the next uh, several, I don't know how many years. Somebody has calculated 1776 years more. But this is the fastest way, the most compassionate way, the most universally applicable way, the most humane way without having to hurt people with radiation, chemo and surgery, those debilitating treatments. When we have uh, just a few cells to kill, that's when all these targeted therapies which are not producing the best responses in very advanced cancers, they will be curative for early disease. So that's the whole thesis of the book. Go early, find the footprints, take care of it right there and then. Okay, my last question, then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, it seems one of the remarkable things about the book are the wonderful quotations, poems, commentaries, culture that's intercalated into the book in its it, it exhibits a remarkable breadth of knowledge. And I wonder, did you get a lot of joy in selecting the connectors, the relevancies, the um, trying to highlight some of the points in very powerful and poignant mm -hmm. ways and so forth? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> so, Lee, this is who I am. I mean, I. Poetry is very much in my, crispered into my DNA since birth, I think, because I come from a deeply oral culture 
and uh, from a family where poetry is uh, something that um, you are meant to commit to memory from the get go. Uh, so by the time each of us seven siblings, we were like 10 years old, we were all made to commit thousands of verses of poetry, English, Urdu, Persian, um, to memory. And in um, sometimes I feel like uh, the two lines of a couplet are very similar to the double helical strand of DNA because in the two strands of DNA it's a microcosm but it contains a macrocosm of message for the, uh, for the formation of a protein for example. In the same way uh, two lines of poetry can contain a universe of meaning and it just came so naturally to naturally to me because that's how I think. Um, I'll give you one or maybe two examples of this. These days I'm obsessed by Emily Dickinson. So here is something she said which I don't think it's in the book but as we were talking as, as you were pointing this out that this is the one that came into my mind. I measure every grief I meet with analytic eyes. I wonder if it weighs like mine or has a different size. I wonder if they bore it long or did it just begin. I cannot find the date of mine, it's been so long a pain. I wonder if it hurts to live and if they have to try and whether could they choose between they would not rather die. It's the kind of question I'm faced with. And the other one, I again, Emily Dickinson, I'll end with this. After Harvey died, it was a very strange, surreal, subliminal space I existed in for a while because suddenly everything that was the focus of your attention for five years is gone. So I felt a cleavage in my mind as if my brain had split. I tried to match it seam by seam but could not make them fit. The thought behind I strove to join unto the thought before but sequence raveled out of reach like balls upon the floor. Okay, I think we'll open it for questions. There are microphones, I think, at either end. It'd be nice if you just say your name and then uh, ask your questions. So. I had a wonderful presentation of poetry and knowledge. One, two questions. One, what was Andrew's alternative from hospice point of view, how many months, weeks, might he have had instead of the agony? Second question, where is the financial incentive to find the first cell? Both Bill Gates and Paul Allen, to mention a couple of people we know, uh, have, have had uh, adventures near cancer. Well, one, one died of it, and the other's mother died of it. Um, but what are the financial incentives to find the first step? There we go. Thank you. The Andrew question is a very important one that uh, what was the hospice alternative for Andrew? What should have been done? And that's why I titled that was honesty a choice even? One of the important things that I did in the book, which I think no one has done before because I don't know if anyone has written with such detail about patients before, but 
I went back to the families of patients and asked them years later if they were to cast a backward glance knowing what they know now how would they change decisions that were made back then. So Umar who is a 38 year old who dies in chapter 1 has been dead for 10 years. His mother, his wife, his sister, his brother wrote everybody in the afterword of the book. Andrew's mother and sister wrote beautiful pieces. My daughter wrote also. His mother said something which really upset me and affected me deeply. She said, Azra, the thing that hurt me very much was that they would come and give us this choice and say, we'll give you radiation therapy but you can refuse because it really doesn't matter. So she said, why? I, it confused her and Andrew both. So why are you offering me something that's not going to matter? But then if you don't do anything, what do you do with a 22 year old? So she has written that in the book. She says, I wish they gave him a placebo without telling him that it's a placebo. Basically, try not to break his spirit, but not hurt him at least. These are, this is where you have to ask yourself, where does the responsibility of the individual end and society's responsibility begins. Why aren't we asking these fundamentally ethical questions about what are we doing instead of always promoting the anecdote who's doing well. This is my point that look at what we are doing to the majority of people. And your second question about the financial issue, this is the richest country in the world. There is no dearth of money and support for cancer research. Six billion dollars a year are raised just for breast cancer research. If six billion dollars a year are being invested in research for breast cancer, where are all the wonderful therapies for breast cancer? Why are we still treating women with chemotherapy? Why are we disfiguring them with surgery? Where is all the, I mean, so why isn't that money just being refocused? Is my point, mainly because there is no awareness. And so education of the public, making everyone aware, telling the truth, taking off blinders and actually facing ourselves in the mirror somehow that we have failed. Let's try something else now. That's my answer to you. The financial issue is to me not a problem because as long as we set a new goal and have some benefits financially coming from it, everyone will go to that. So whether it's Bill Gates or uh, uh, whether it is uh, cancer survivors funding, the money is there. It's the will that has to change. Uh, thank you so much. I'm a hematology fellow and physician scientist at the Hutch, and I work at Melbourne University, so thank you for all your work. Um, my question is about this. One thing that, that really frustrates me is, is I believe in everything you're saying, but I'm worried about how much petty squabbling there goes on in between all of us as scientists in terms of the competition that's called us to get grants that are limited, to publish papers in journals like Elsevier that make triple the profit of Netflix, and we sit here clawing in each other's eyeballs trying to get these funds when we should be collaborating so much more. Does that ever frustrate you or do you have a good answer? What a lovely question and thank you so much for asking. My heart goes out to you. You know when I gave grand rounds three years ago, I thought let's let me begin in the lion's den. So I began at Columbia University by giving grand rounds and basically presented the the data that 95% clinical trials fail today, the fact that 70% of what is being published in Nature, in New England Journal of Medicine, in Science, in the top journals, 70% is not reproducible at all. Um, 
42 percent people who get cancer are financially ruined. I mean the statistics are so bad you can't make them up. So when I finished, Ed Gelman, my colleague, got up, who was the head of the division previously, got up and said, Azra, before the young people and fellows in the room slit their wrists, <laughs> tell them what to do, please, until a cure is found. And I have addressed that at great length in the book, that before we start criticizing the young people for not spending enough time with the patients, not giving them the uh, kind of face-to-face -face care that they need or not writing enough papers, we need to see what we are doing to the young people. So before demanding something from them, let's look at exactly how we have set up these fake goals for them. I just was at, uh, in Boston and Providence and several young fellows came to me and said, Dr. Raza, the only criterion for being recruited for a junior faculty position, several people said this to me, only criteria is, okay, we will take you on in our department, but we want to know how many industry-sponsored clinical trials will you be able to open. Because that's what brings money to the institution. These clinical trials are going to fail. What are patients? Companies, resources? So why, have, why are academic centers setting goals like this for young people? Instead of encouraging them to think creatively, why this me too mentality all the time? Because somebody else is doing it, we should keep doing this? No. So my answer, it's a very long-winded answer to you, but my heart goes out to young people starting out. I just interviewed a young uh, faculty rec uh, recruit the other day and he was describing he's going to set up this whole thing, studying in, in animals the metabolism of uh, the, the Warburg effect in uh, uh, detail. And I said to him that no matter what, you see, you're going to get caught up into this trap of you have to get, you'll get one million dollars to come and start your program. Then you are expected within three years to get NIH funding for yourself. That means within this three years you need to publish a paper in a high profile journal. Now, if you don't, your, your position is going to disappear like that. And before long you'll have children in college to support and then it becomes like, oh, I have to support my children. So now their tuition has to be paid. So where does all the originality disappear now? Because it becomes a matter of you just have to keep doing what will get you the grant money. I think that system has to break. And what do you think, Lee? Tell this young man what's your advice. I think the fundamental I think the fundamental question is how can we deal with disease and I think there's only one reasonable answer and that's early detection and early reversibility and that basically requires acquiring new sets of tools thinking about uh, population genetics and genomics in new and different kinds of ways. Uh, it requires going outside the standard accepted norms of what you should be doing. And those are all really difficult things for young people to do. No, but that's why it's important that we have to change the system for you, that the system shouldn't be demanding this kind of thing from a young person. That's my point. Yeah. It is not their responsibility, it's our responsibility to give them a better model to work with. You know, it's, it's the whole question of how you get paradigm changes accepted is, is really a fascinating issue because People intrinsically are really conservative and they're very reluctant to give up long-held beliefs. And the, the, the key thing in getting people to give up their old entrenched beliefs is to show clearly the new way yes. 
is going to transform how we think about medicine and That's, how we yeah. think about science. And you can do that on a small scale and put in a wedge that uh, can make an enormous difference over time. So it's not that young people can't do really important things and be a part of the responsibility we as older ones have to uh, to, to change the uh, to change the paradigms. But I will say, what is also true is young people are far more able to create new paradigms than old people are. Because we get, we, we become prisoners to that same conservative uh, accepted way of thinking, but it's the fresh. Young people who don't know that you're not supposed to think that way. The analogy. <laughs> The analogy I give in the book, though, is that if we kept tinkering with the typewriter, we would never invent the word processor. But once you invented the word processor, then you never look at the typewriter. So the point is that once the paradigm shifts, and to shift the paradigm, you have to show a positive way. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I agree with you. <laughs> we should do both, top and bottom. I think you gave a very impassioned plea. Thank you so much. I agree with everything you yeah, said. Thank you so but much. don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Thank you so much for this important discussion. Um, I am a physician locally, and at 5 o'clock this evening, I very gently told a nice old fellow that the coffee it had for the last month was not an infection, but it's a large mass in his right lung. And we know that it probably was a malignancy and probably would require biopsy to diagnosis and treatment, and that there were many options for treatment. And I saw in his eyes what I've seen a thousand times. That same sudden realization that comes to the eyes of these guys. I never should have let my wife bring me in here today. <laughs> right? Most men understand this very clearly. 
There's your life up until the diagnosis, which is worry free, and then your life after the diagnosis. And there's this notion of lead time bias. And if you improve the diagnostics, but you don't improve the treatment options, you just give people a longer span of their life knowing that they have cancer, but their total lifespan doesn't change. So, if, and I, what I want you to do is just comment on my bias here, that the treatments are actually where the emphasis needs to be for most of these malignancies, because finding them early, finding a few malignant cells in the prostate with a PSA elevation, doesn't seem to improve anybody's lifespan. It just gives them an extra five years of knowing that they have a cancer. And so the treatments actually have to be for all the emphasis. I agree that better treatments have to be developed. Right. But the same treatments, for example, you are a physician, so you know that CML is curable almost now with imatinib, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But if the, it has, has moved beyond the chronic phase, then that drug is no use alone by itself, right? right? So earlier stage, the same thing works to cure the disease, but as soon as it has even accelerated, that efficacy is gone. No one can argue with the fact that the earlier you find the cancer, the better it is uh, treatable. Right. So all what Lee and I are saying is that even before it has become a bona fide cancer, we should be able to detect the earliest markers and try and see what non-invasive techniques can then be used to disrupt that. So, for example, using just uh, if a pinhead is identified and we follow that with, let's say we don't know whether this is really malignant or not, so we hit it with sound waves and when sound waves is like yelling at the tumor, Sam Gambir at uh, Canary Center says you yell at the tumor through sound waves, it yells back by shaking and shedding its protein in the blood. You draw the blood, you do liquid biopsies, you look for the biomarkers, you find mutated DNA, cell-free DNA, microRNAs, whatever you're looking for and confirm that it's a life-threatening aggressive tumor. Now you have a few million cells to deal with, not hundreds of billions, right. which can be targeted with a laser or something very uh, straightforward. So I think you are absolutely right that without having some treatment, we may not be able to uh, reverse the whole problem. But what we are saying is that the same treatment that's failing today uh, can work much better earlier on. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, you guys spoke about uh, looking for early detection. And so my father passed away from uh, non-small cell lung adenocarcinoma. My grandfather passed away from pancreatic cancer. I have gotten genetic tests, and uh, there doesn't seem to be many markers that they're looking for. So in the absence of a blanket that can detect heat from growing uh, cancer cells, what are the things that we can do now that we have in our arsenal for early detection for people, you know, who have a history, a family history of cancer? Not very much. <laughs> no insurance will cover total body scanning for you right now. Not that it will detect very early cancers also. Uh, there are a lot of people trying to develop whole body scanning, MRIs, CT scans. CT scans are too... Um, aggressive, but MRIs with AI, artificial intelligence, to detect even regions of interest rather than actual tumors and follow them. It's, this is exactly the kind of uh, person like you who is at high risk of getting cancer because of a family history. Someone's at high risk because of having had one cancer. You are at high risk because of such a strong family history. So. It's imperative, it's absolutely urgent that we develop these markers to find out what could be detected in your blood, your urine, your sweat, your tears, your saliva. What can we find that is, will give us the first whiff that there's something abnormal going on and then start looking for it. You know that Grail just announced uh, for the ASCO 
uh, they announced that they can not only uh, find markers in the blood for early detection of uh, many of the common cancers, but that they also just from discovering the mutated DNA or some methylation markers, they can tell which organ it's coming from as well. So, so follow up question. Um, I also used to work at the Hutch. <laughs> but as, <laughs> as someone who's not a clinician, I have a background in math and machine learning, I'm a little bit more optimistic about finding the yeah. cures. Um, you talked about this massive uh, uh, like cache of tissues. Um, what are the chances that, you know, that data will eventually make it to people like me? Like who can actually mine for it, who can actually build models, and who can actually try to figure things out? Yes, this is exactly what we have to do, what Lee and I have been saying. What you are saying has to be done. People like you who really have uh, one area of expertise needs to work across disciplines with other uh, individuals like a clinician, a basic scientist, molecular biologist, nanotechnologist, uh, uh, big data analyzers. We all have to work across disciplines to try and find the first cell. And you ask me what are the chances? 100%. It will be done. The question is how fast will it be done? And that depends on the resources we are going to invest. But we cannot continue the way things are right now. We ju it's untenable situation. It's unaffordable by the country to keep developing these failing drugs that are just uh, bleeding away the economy of the country. So things have to change. How quickly will they change depends on a number I'll, of things. I'll add one more thing to that. I think one thing anybody can do that has a, a history like you do is absolutely to optimize your, your wellness. And the reason I say that is that optimizes your immune system, which is an incredibly important surveillance system for cancer and so forth. So I, th I think there are really ways to do it. Now, how do you optimize wellness? That's a complicated question we could talk about, but there are ways that people have done it and, and had really terrific kinds of results. And I'm really convinced wellness is one of the greatest preventatives for disease we can possibly have. So I think maybe it's time to leave on that optimistic note. Actually, I... Uh, oh, there's... No, I was oh, one more. No, I think I'm going to forego it. Actually, no, I won't. I think respond <laughs> to that. It's not a question, it's a statement. And just to, to the gentleman, two questions before we talked about um, living your life in a constant state of awareness of cancer. I just, I'm, since so many of you in the audience probably know already that I myself am actually living with cancer at the moment, I want to say that for the last two and a half years, um, that state of awareness has been a gift, a perverse kind of a gift to me, and that it has made me grateful for even the very worst like lowest moments of life feel, um, uh, I feel a joy of being alive, I feel a gratitude for my relationships with my family, my children, my, they're, they're my family. For my children, my wife, my friends, I feel um, more alive in a strange way than I've ever felt. And um, I know that my, my treatment to date has been far more, um, far gentler on my body than many people, and many, certainly many of the cases you described, but I just wanted uh, to offer that that one testimony that um, that for me living with cancer has um, uh, brought me to a new kind of awareness, a new kind of gratitude about life that I, I hadn't experienced before. I asked my wife the other day, "How long do I have to live for cancer to actually have been a gift to my life? If I get another ten years, I, I can look back and say that the last ten years of my life were the best ten years of my life, and I, I probably feel pretty good about it. If it's taken from me another." Six months or 12 months, I'll fill it off, with no question. But, but if I get another 10 years, it's unquestionably a gift. So I, I guess maybe I should have that. I was going to step to the mic before that and thank you both, Dr. Rasa, Dr. Hood, for being with us tonight and sharing what you know and holding us uh, to, to, to take on the challenge of this future. Um, I shared the last speaker's often, the last question's often, something that we can get there and we can get through to the
But thank you so much. I like to have the last word. So, <laughs> uh, first of all, what a beautiful testimonial we just heard. That is, this man is the helium that oncologists need to continue to survive. Thank you so much for stepping up and having the courage to say it and having the sensitivity, the exquisite sensitivity with which you stated it. And for myself, I want to end with a short poem again. This time, Alfred Lord Tennyson. Beautiful piece by him. The lights begin to twinkle on the rocks. The long day wanes, the slow moon rises. The deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends, it's not too late to seek a newer world. For my purpose still holds to sail beyond all the stars in the western sky until I die. It may be we shall see the happy isles. It may be we shall meet the great Achilles whom we knew. And though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that force which in olden days moved heaven and earth, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts. Made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find and not to yield. Thank you.